Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of the Million Pound Mission Podcast. It's your buddy, Adam, the PhD, the previously heavy dude, and this is episode number 362. We're talking about never binging again with Dr. Glenn Livingston. This is a good one, folks. Uh, But first, let's catch up just a little bit. Two quick reminders. Uh, We are doing our Keto Brick giveaway for all your low-carb lifestyle and keto fans out there listening in. Uh, I'd love to give you uh, 30 free keto bricks. And the way you enter for that is we are doing a drawing. Uh, Anytime you order a keto brick from ketobrick.com, use the promo code MPM, as in million pound mission, MPM, and you'll be entered to win for a free month of keto bricks. I'm also doing another monthly giveaway for sharing out your favorite Million Pound Mission podcast episode on Instagram stories. So all you have to do is screenshot this episode or one of your recent favorites, and you can enter as many as one time per day on this one. And at the end of the month, we are going to do a giveaway for a variety pack. Just share out your favorite episode, tag at Million Pound Mission on Instagram, and share it out on your Instagram story. And I will do a uh, entry every single time you tag me on that story. And we'll announce the winner uh, at the end of the 28-day cycle. So two different ways to win Keto Bricks. Keto Bricks are awesome. They are 1,000 calories of keto deliciousness. My favorite flavor right now is peanut butter. Uh, my kindergarten da- daughter asked for the coconut cream and the mocha flavor. My son, Henry, is nine. He enjoys cookies and cream. So uh, it's a great low-carb snack. A lot of people are starting to get back into traveling, especially with business travel. It's a game changer. You get 1,000 calories of perfect keto nutrition. Check them out at ketobrick.com. Last quick reminder, uh, if you need a little boost with your transformation journey right now, don't forget I've got an amazing free mini course, The 7 Necessary Steps for Long-Term Weight Loss Success. Check it out at millionpoundmission.com. All right, enough chit-chat. It's time to dig in to this episode because this is an important topic. I know a lot of people out there Uh, have struggled or are currently struggling with their relationship with food and specifically binge eating. So this is a serious issue that we're going to take head on with this podcast episode with my friend, Dr. Glenn Livingston. So Dr. Glenn is a veteran psychologist that was the longtime CEO of a multi-million dollar consulting firm, which has serviced several Fortune 500 clients in the food industry. And he's got some very interesting thoughts about the food industry that we talk about. So he's pretty much disillusioned by what traditional psychology had to offer overweight and or food obsessed individuals. So Dr. Livingston decided to spend several decades, decades, people doing research uh, on the, the nature of binging and overeating via work with his own patients and a self-funded research program with more than 40,000 participants. So for those of you that love science and data, uh, this is going to be a good one. Uh, But most importantly, however, it was his own personal journey out of obesity to a normal, healthy weight and a much more lighthearted relationship with food. So in this episode, we get into the definition of what a binge is, and uh, I really have him clearly defined, like, because I want you guys to know like, okay, am I binging? Am I, am I really struggling with this or am I just kind of overeating and having cravings? So we really try to draw a line there on what a binge actually is. We talk about the mental components of why we binge eat. And then we dive into some very simple techniques that he's used, that his clients have used, that people on his program have used to help us all reclaim control in our battle against binge eating. So without any further delay, Let's dive into episode number 362, Never Binge Again, with Dr. Glenn Livingston. Dr. Glenn Livingston, welcome to the Million Pound Mission Podcast. How are we doing today, my friend? I'm doing really well. It's a nice day out, and um, I have the best job in the world, and I'm a happy guy. Yes. Well, I'm super happy that you're here because the topic that you really have some expertise around is a topic that I know for a fact that many of our audience members listening in really struggle with. And we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the binge eating scenario and and all the things around that. Uh, But I I would love to have you talk a little bit about what is uh, kind of the origin story of you 
being interested in this, your own health journeys. I know anybody that becomes a leader in health uh, in the health space, there's, there's a story behind that. So what does that I, look I like a, for you? Got a story in spades, actually. Yeah, so I'm around 205 now. Um, I hover between like 200 and 210. That's my range. And I used to be about 280, and my triglycerides were uh, over 1,000 at one point. And the doctors were telling me I was going to die by the time I was 40. And um, see, I'm 6'4". I'm moderately muscular. I don't really look it right now, but but I am. And, and <laughs> well, it's you know it's been the pandemic for a couple of months, and um, and I figured out when I was about seventeen that if I worked out for two hours a day, maybe three hours a day, I could eat whatever I wanted to. So I don't know if you've ever stopped by a Seven Eleven in Syosset, New York, or a pizza place and found out they were all out. But if, um, if you did, it's probably because I was there just before you. <laughs> so it's, it's, it sounds like a joke. And I, I, you know, when I was young, when I was young, it was just a joke. It was just like, uh, you know, I could eat everything. Give me boxes of muffins. Give me, you know, six lattes. They didn't call it that back then. Give me, you know, munchkins and pizza and chocolate bars. And, and I, could eat, I could eat everything. I just, I just could. And I was tall and thin. And I thought it was great. I thought it was amazing. Um, we'd have a word for it today, which would be exercise bulimia, but I didn't really know that back then. And it worked for me until I was 22 or 23. And when I went to graduate school, I, I got married young, I was 22. And I was commuting two hours a day to go to graduate school in each direction. And I was seeing patients and graduate school in psychology was a lot harder than undergraduate school. So I had to study a lot. And I was helping my wife at the time, I'm divorced now, but I was helping her to run the business. And sometimes she wanted to actually talk to me. Um, I imagine that. And um, I couldn't work out, you know, a half an hour a week, much, much less two hours a day. But I found that the food had a hold on me, that it had developed a life of its own. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I couldn't stop eating how much I was eating. Um, and because I come from a family of 17 psychotherapists, like, yeah, you can feel sorry for me later. <laughs> I was going to say, whoa. No, it's like everybody, um, something breaks in the house. Everybody knows how to ask it, how it feels, but nobody knows how to fix it. You know, uh, that, that was my life. But because I came from that family, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I, I've always really wanted to be a good psychologist. It's really important to me. And, um, you know, so I, I went to every possible uh, permutation of psychologist or psychiatrist or eating disorder program you could think of. Overeaters Anonymous, um, you know, I took medication, I saw nutritionists. Um, I kept on trying to fix the hole in my heart. I figured if I could fix the hole in my heart, then I'd stop trying to fill the hole in my stomach. Mm. And, um, you know, the whole thing really bothered me a lot more than though I'm, I'm tall, so the weight didn't look that bad. People would say I'm still handsome. I mean, I see pictures of me at almost 280 pounds, and I don't think I was still handsome, but people said I, I held it well. More so than the looks and the weight, what really bothered me was that I couldn't be present. And to be a great psychologist, you got to lend people your soul. Like, you, you just got to be there. And I was working with suicidal adolescents, and I was working with couples right after there'd been an affair in some very high-risk situations. And thank God I never lost anyone. And thank God, you know, out of like 250 couples I saw, I think only two of them got divorced. Um, but I, I did a lot of that with my head. I did a lot of it with, um, you know, my studies and my careful attention, not really with my soul. I didn't have the impact that I really wanted to have because I'd be sitting working with this kid who wanted to jump and I'd be thinking, when can I get a pizza? Wow. You know, when, when, when can I get my next chocolate bars? And that really, really bothered me because that's all that was ever important to me was being a great psychologist. So after going from, you know, Overeaters Eaters Anonymous to this psychologist to that psychologist, which was a very, very soulful journey. Um, and I would sometimes lose a little weight and then I would gain more and I'd get thin and then I'd get fat and then I'd get thin and then I'd get fatter. And the doctors were yelling at me the whole time. Um, I finally started looking at some alternative perspectives. And he, there were three things that gave me a very strong alternative perspective. I'll tell you the result of it up front. The result of it was that I went from a let's nurture our inner wounded child and heal the hole in my heart perspective on overeating to a 
no, this is more like a controlling the reptilian brain thing. This is a, this is a game of dominance and um, ruthless control and superiority, not really a game of, you know, healing your inner wounded child, which is a good thing to do, but it didn't seem to have to have an impact, at least for me on overeating. Right. Um, and the three things that really changed my perspectives were this. I didn't have kids and I didn't commute because my ex-wife traveled for business. And so I was consulting for industry, uh, mostly big food and big pharma. And I saw that big food was spending probably billions of dollars to engineer hyper palatable concentrations of starch and sugar and fat and oil and excitotoxins that were all designed to hit our bliss point in the lizard brain, like in the seat of the feast and famine response, to hit the bliss point without giving us enough nutrition to feel satisfied. And that had nothing the F to do with the fact that my mama didn't love me enough when I was a kid right. or that I was in a bad marriage. or any, It had nothing, nothing to do with that. It was just that um, it's an overwhelming force, billions of dollars aligned against my better judgment. When you, when you short circuit a mammal's pleasure center, what happens is that the pleasure drive gets hijacked. And so, and so there are all these animal studies where you know, they wired the pleasure center to the animals, um, to, to a lever that an animal could push. And they found that that animal forgot about all of its survival needs and it just pressed the lever thousands of times a day, yeah. right? <laughs> right? Um, you know, because they, when you get a direct stimulation, it can be better than sex. It can be better than any other natural food you could possibly eat. And so the brain says, that's what I'm here for. Like these are evolutionary buttons. These are very, very strong buttons. And, you know, I'm not saying that big food was, um, you know, was putting electrodes in our brain, but when you, you think about, you can walk out of a McDonald's and see a Burger King across the street. You got to say there's some chemical electrodes around. You know, it's, it's happening. So there's this big force outside of me. Then I was privy to what was happening in the advertising industry because I was an advertising consultant. And I knew that everybody thinks that advertising doesn't affect them. And that's exactly where the advertising industry wants you. They want you to believe it doesn't affect you because when you think it doesn't affect you, your sales resistance is down. And believe me, they're not spending billions of dollars for nothing. But believe me, they're not doing that. Um, and there were things happening like, uh, you know, I work with a major food bar manufacturer who will remain nameless so they don't sue my ass. Um, <laughs> good call, good call. Good call. Um, and the VP, who was a friend of mine, walked up to me and said, Glenn, I got to tell you what the most profitable thing we ever did was. You won't believe it. I said, all right. He said, we took the vitamins out of the bar and we made the packaging look healthy instead. And I said, so you mean... He said, yeah, the vitamins were too expensive and they tasted bad. So what we did is we, we made the packaging look, packaging look really shiny and colorful and diverse. So like in nature, think of a salad with really green lettuce and yellow carrots and yellow peppers and you know, purple cabbage and blueberries and red tomatoes. And that diversity of vibrant color signals the brain that there's a diversity of nutrients available. And the brain says, that's what I want. There's a reason that we love color. It just signals the diversity of nutrient availability and that's what we want. And so the big advertising knows this. And so they help everything get packaged up and presented in that way so that your brain thinks that you need it to survive. And as a result of this, you know, we're all walking around think we, thinking that we can't live without this stuff. And every time we look for love at the bottom of a bag or a box or a container, there's some fat cat in a white suit with a mustache laughing all the way to the back. Right. But that's just how it is, right? So I said, okay, there are these overwhelming forces aligned against me. That's, so that was one factor that made me have to flip my paradigm. Another factor was I was reading this alternative addiction treatment literature by Jack Trimpey, who worked mostly with um, drugs and alcohol, you know, the kinds of things you can give up entirely. It's like I call them black and white addictions. Right, right. Whereas food is something you got to take the lion out of the cage and walk around the block a couple of times. Exactly. <laughs> right. And what he basically uh, partitioned the brain into two parts, the reptilian brain or the lower brain and the, uh, and the upper brain. And he said, look, most of what's important to us as human beings is in the upper brain. You know, the lower brain just knows eat, mate, or kill. 
it's like a college game, right? Do I eat it? Do I mate with it or do I kill it? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, I, I wish this wasn't true. It's, it's funny, but it's true. Yes. And, and then the upper brain is where our long-term goals are. The upper brain says, you know, before you eat, mate, or kill that thing, what impact is this going to have on your loved ones, on your connections in society, on your weight loss in the long run, on your fitness, on your and the kind of person you want to be on your spirituality and your music and your art and your contribution. What, what kind of impact will this have on the person you're trying to be in the world? And I said, okay, so this is a matter of the upper brain modulating the lower brain's impulses. These are very strong impulses. They're not going to go away. That's, and they're survival drives. That's why people say, just hand over the chocolate and nobody gets hurt. But they're going to have to be modulated just like every other biological impulse is modulated. You walk down the street, you see a really pretty girl, you don't run up to her and kiss her, right? Um, I, mean, I have to talk to her in a particular way in a particular time, and um, I've always been kind of shy, so I just don't do that anyway. <laughs> um, I got a girlfriend now. But, but, um, but there's a way and a time and a civilized place and a procedure, and we tell our reproductive organs that, you know, whoa there, Nelly, you know, we, we, can, we, we can look at that, but you know, there, there's, a, there's a time and a place and a way to do that. Right. Same thing, Adam, if I really had to pee right now, but I'm in the middle of a business meeting, I, I'm going to finish the podcast first, right? I'm going to oh, say- That's good to know. That's good to know. <laughs> but I'm going to tell my bladder, well, I'm talking to Adam right now. I'm not, I'm not going to go pee right now. I'll pee afterwards. What, <laughs> I'll take care of you later. And I, I live comfortably with that impulse. It's part of who I am. I recognize that I have some animal needs. But I have made a decision to be an adult in the world, a participant in society. I have other goals and other needs. And I assume superiority over my bladder. I assume superiority over my testicles, right? I'm, and so I said, well, why can't I assume superiority over this desire to eat junk? And for me, it always started with chocolate. It's like chocolate and then pizza and then everything else. But it always started with chocolate. Last thing that swept, flipped my paradigm and made me think that I had to be more of an alpha wolf dealing with the challenger for leadership than a um, therapist helping a wounded inner child get better was um, I did this study. I was getting paid a lot of money to do these studies, and so I knew how to do them. And this was back in the days when internet clicks were really cheap. This was like the late 90s or so. And I set up a study looking to see the types of stresses that people were experiencing in their life and what food they ran to that they couldn't stop eating when they started. Mm. And there were three major categories of foods that I found findings for. People who struggled with chocolate like me, they tended to be lonely or brokenhearted. They were stressed in their love life. People who struggled with crunchy, salty things like pretzels and chips, they tended to be stressed at work. And people who struggled with soft, chewy things like bread and bagels and pasta, or even pizza, they tended to be stressed at home. Mm. And so I thought that was really interesting. I actually got a lot of press for that. And a lot of the things that you, you know, when you see my name in all these different periodicals, it's probably because of something with that study. Right. Um, but it led me down the wrong road. It, it, I really thought, okay, well, now I've got it. You know, now I know exactly what's behind the chocolate addiction. Before I started talking about that publicly, I decided I would talk to my mom about it because she was a therapist and she raised me and I said mom I really struggle with chocolate and it's true I'm a little depressed and brokenhearted I'm not really happy in my love life um, but where did this start how did I wind up with the pattern of running to chocolate when I felt lonely or brokenhearted and she looks down and she gets all depressed and ashamed and I said mom mom it's okay whatever it was this I was in my 40s then I said mom it was 40 years ago whatever happened I'm just trying to figure it out I love you I forgive you it's okay she says, well, I'm so sorry, but when you were one year old in 1965, your dad, my husband, was a captain in the army, and they were talking about sending him to Vietnam, and I was terrified because we were trying to get pregnant again, and I figured I'm going to have two little kids. I'm going to be an army widow, no way to support myself, and I'm going to miss him, and I was terrified, and at the same time, my father, your grandfather, just got out of prison. And I'd idolized this guy my whole life, but he was guilty. And so I was horribly depressed. So I was horribly depressed and I was horribly anxious. And there you were, this one-year-old little kid that 
wanted to eat something, wanted to be hugged, wanted to be played with. And I didn't have it in me because I was sitting and staring at the wall. So I put a little refrigerator on the floor and I always kept it filled with chocolate Bosco syrup. Wow. <laughs> and, and when you come running to me for a hug or to play or for some food, I would say, Glenn, go get your Bosco. And you'd go running over or crawling over to the refrigerator. You'd open it up, you'd suck on the bottle and you'd go into a chocolate sugar coma. Oh my God. Right? So, so <laughs> right, exactly. And so Adam, you would think that if this were a movie, at this point, mom and I would have a big hug and a big cry, and I would never have trouble with chocolate again, right? right. I say, mom, I forgive you. That, that's it, Eureka. That's why I struggle with chocolate. Right. Um, that's not what happened. I mean, I hugged my mom, and it did help me to forgive myself. It did help me to be a little softer on myself about how hard it had been. Um, I certainly forgave my mom, and we had some interesting talks. It was a good talk to have. But I actually got worse with the chocolate. And the reason I got worse was there was this little voice in my head that I discovered at that point that said something like, um, hey, Glenn, you know what? You're right. Our mama didn't love us enough. And she left a great big chocolate-sized hole in your heart. And until you can find the love of your life and get out of this marriage, we're going to have to keep on binging on chocolate. Yippee, let's go get some right now. And so um, my that inner destructive voice of justification was taking advantage of every situation it could. And that, that was a moment of insight for me because at that point I said, well, look, if the emotion is the fire, a roaring fire in a well-contained fireplace in the living room is an asset. It's not, it's not a problem. Um, as long as the fireplace doesn't let the ashes escape to burn down the house, you're okay. As a matter of fact, people gather around it, they tell stories, they make connections, it becomes the center of hearth and home. But if you have something poking holes in that fireplace, and I think of that as the voice of justification, then the ashes can get out and burn down the house. And I started to think, okay, so I've got to be the alpha wolf and take control of this voice of justification that's challenging me for leadership so it doesn't poke holes in the fireplace. Now, this is the embarrassing part, because this is how I got better um, in my early 40s after you know, almost 30 years of suffering with, with binge eating. And you know, tens of thousands of dollars of psychotherapy and all the traditional roots. I decided that I was going to call my reptilian brain my inner pig. I sometimes wish I picked a different metaphor because I, now I'm a popular guy talking about this pig inside me. Um, but I did. I, I called out my inner pig, and this was going to be private. I wasn't going to tell people about this. I decided I was going to draw very clear lines in the sand that defined healthy behavior, like I will only ever have chocolate on a weekend again, only on a Saturday or Sunday. I'll never have it Monday to Friday again. Um, there are different rules that I experimented with, but that was one of the first ones. And then if I heard a voice in my head that suggested it was okay to have chocolate on a Wednesday, I would say, that's my pig. It's squealing for pig slop. Chocolate is pig slop on a Wednesday. I don't eat pig slop. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. And as ridiculous and crude as that sounds for a you know, I'm a sophisticated psychologist. I've published all these articles and I've been in all these major periodicals and I've done tens of millions of dollars of consulting for industry. I couldn't get better until I said, I don't eat pig slop and I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. Right. And, and it, it wasn't a miracle, Adam. It wasn't like I was immediately all better. What happened immediately was that I no longer felt powerless and confused. I no longer felt at the mercy. And I started to realize I, would, I could wake up and make a choice. And slowly but surely, I started to make the right choice because I was making the rules. Nobody was making the rules for me. So what's the point of breaking your own rules? So I just made rules that I could live with. And um, over time, I started to comply more and more. And I, that's my story. I got thin. My triglycerides came down. I lost my rosacea and eczema and all the other health problems. The doctor stopped yelling at me. And um, I don't need pig slop. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. I published Hell yeah. The- yeah. <laughs> well, I think, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of people, you know, I've been involved in, in the, the weight loss game for over a decade. And it seems like when people can cross that line of taking personal responsibility, that's a huge leap. I, I talk about uh, people will you know, send me questions on Instagram, like what's the best exercise or what's, what's the hardest exercise? I'm like, well, the hardest exercise is taking that that finger, uh, that, that finger pointing outward and going, it's everyone else's fault and turning it and saying, I accept responsibility yeah. for, for what's happening. That's the hardest exercise to do, right? Yeah. 
So, but let's talk about that a little bit. Just is that point of like, how do we get people to that point? Just like you did without the, the, the whole like 30 year part, like how, how can we do this faster and better That's and what we more do efficiently? Now. Yeah. That's yeah. How do, do we do that? Yeah. Part of it is first acknowledging that as long as you allow your pig to point the fingers at all these other diet gurus, that you're going to be in a losing game because it will constantly say that diet guru's diet is no good. It was kind of fun for a while, but you're going to have to try something else. And in the meantime, we might as well binge. Yippee, let's go get some right now, right? Um, and so you're actually, when you're totally adopting other people's diets without taking responsibility for what part works for you and what part doesn't, you're, um, you're setting up a, an icon to knock down that, that the pig is going to want to knock down. So it's really important to start with your own system. I start people with one simple rule. I tell them that our pigs want to set up these big complex diets. And unless your doctor says it's an emergency, it's actually usually not a good idea. What you want to do is come up with one simple rule that'll just get the ship moving in the right direction. And I'll give you an example. There's this trucker, he ate fast food morning, evening, and night, morning, afternoon, and night. And he said, I can't give that up. I'm on the road all the time. But what I will do I won't go back for seconds. That's his only role. And he could do it. And I said, okay, well then, uh, I was actually working with someone who worked with him. And they said, well then, anytime you hear a voice in your head that suggests you go back for seconds, that's your pig. And you don't have to call it a pig. You can call it your food monster or whatever you want to call it. But a lot of people like to call it a pig. So that's your, that's your inner pig. And when you hear that, ask the pig why you're supposed to have that then refute that reason. So maybe the pig will say, you know, you actually walked a lot and loaded a big load this morning in the truck, a lot of exercise. You can get away with it. You're not going to gain weight. You might as well start tomorrow. And then I want you to dispute that because we know that the way the brain works, that if you have a craving and you indulge it today, it's going to be harder to not indulge it tomorrow because you're going to reinforce the addiction. So if you're in a hole, you should stop digging. Um, we know that the only time you can eat healthy is the present. And we know that you made a commitment to do this because at the time when you were of sound mind and body, you thought through the person you wanted to be with food and you decided you're not going to go back for seconds. So th this guy wound up losing 150 pounds, not just from that rule, but the point is that that rule got things going in the right direction. Yeah. 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 And that was the first domino that got flicked over and people... Yeah think they need to put a big bomb in the middle of all the dominoes and get them all at once. Like I'm going to lose a hundred pounds in one workout or one, yeah. you know, one week of dieting. And that's just not, that's just so much, there's so much pressure in that of, I talk about it all the time. People are like, well, I need to discover the, this hugely complex diet that I can do forever. And it's like, there's a lot, there's a lot of time in forever. We may adjust things as we go. We may not want to put that much pressure on ourselves, but uh, just like you said, the simple, like a non-negotiable rule. I remember one of my first personal training clients uh, back when in the days that I owned the gym, when our only rule was she owned a pizza parlor and she was drinking six liters of diet Mountain Dew a day. Six wow. liters. Wow. And she was about five foot tall. And all I said was, let's cut it back to one liter a day. And she lost 20 pounds in like the first month easily. And yeah. she's still drinking a liter a day. Uh, so simple things like that, they initiate momentum, they build confidence. And that's that inner work that really gets that fire going. Exactly. You, you just got to get moving in the right direction. I just want to mention, because you're talking about everybody wanting to lose weight quickly, that overeaters are usually good dieters also, and they've had the experience of losing weight quickly, which is a bad thing. Yeah. Because it turns out that the addiction is not just an addiction to overeating. It's addiction, an addiction to the feast and famine cycle. Like we, we have this belief that we can get rid of whatever damage that we do because we've had this experience of dieting quickly. And so we, um, we allow the uh, yo-yoing back and forth. We, we go into the feast mode when it's available. And if you live in an environment, just imagine from an evolutionary perspective, if you live in an environment where food and nutrition are somewhat scarce for a while, as they are when you're on a diet, and then all of a sudden you came upon a feast you came upon the harvest, it would have been a survival advantage to eat as much as you could. And so when people get involved with over dieting or losing weight too quickly, they're really setting themselves up to gain it all back and more later on. 
because they're keeping their brain in that feast and famine environment. So I, I tell people, try, try to lose a pound, pound and a half a week, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you put those numbers out there because that's something else I hear a lot. Like I did a consultation with somebody yesterday and I was like, well, just tell me about how things have been going. She's like, well, I've lost 14 pounds in the last seven weeks, but I, I feel like I should be losing weight faster. And I'm like, how did the seven weeks before that seven weeks go for you? Did you lose any weight? So no, I gained a bunch of weight. I'm like, okay, so I would call this progress. We're losing two pounds a week. That sounds pretty damn good to me. Yeah. Uh, so like, how, how do you get people out of that mindset though? Of like, I'm not losing weight. I am losing weight, but it's not fast enough, Dr. Glenn. Um, by reviewing their history with them. Most people who are doing that have gained and lost weight so many times yeah, that's true. that if you review their history and you show them how painful that is, and I ask them, do you want to stay in this roller coaster forever? What if I could show you a way to get off the roller coaster? And you know, you're not going to be skinny tomorrow, but you'll eventually get to your ideal weight or close to it. Yeah. And you'll be able to maintain it. Like, what, yeah. wouldn't, you, wouldn't you rather do that? that? That's how I get them away from there. Excellent. Excellent yeah. technique. Now, you speak on binging. You've got a book about never binging again. How do you define the word binge? That's, I, I, there's some variation in the, in the health space about what exactly that means. How do you define that? So the question in and of itself usually comes from the pick because what's really going on when someone asks that, and I'll, I'll answer the question you know, as a doctor and everything, but, but um, what's really going on when someone asks that question is that the pig is saying, we're not really that bad yet, right? We can get away with a little more overeating, right? We're, we're not clinically diagnosable as a binge eating disorder, right? Right. Um, and so I actually, I take a lot of heat for this definition, but I tell people to think of a binge as one step off of their planned eating. Now that doesn't mean that if you take one step off of their planned eating, they should take more. Because most people are of the mindset that if they're not perfect, then they're nothing. And, you know, if they yeah. have one bite off their plan, then they should screw it for the day and just, you know, have a food orgy for the day or the week or the month and go back at it next time. Um, but I tell them that's kind of like if you accidentally chip the tooth, you go get a hammer to bang the rest of them out. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> right? Or like if you, if you touch a hot stove accidentally, do, do you say... I am a pathetic hot stove toucher. I might as well put my whole hand down on the stove. <laughs> through it, right? No, it's just, you know, I, I think of it like aiming for a bullseye on an archery target. You aim with perfection, meaning that you try to make yourself one with the bullseye. You purge all the doubt and distraction and uncertainty from your mind. You see, you see the arrow going into the bullseye before you let go. And then after you let go, you see where it hit. Now, if you miss the bullseye, the fact that you know exactly where the bullseye is and you know, where, you know where the line around it is, you'll know exactly by how much you missed the bullseye, so you'll get the feedback necessary to make the adjustment and do better next time. That's why I say that a binge is one bite off of your plan, because I, um, otherwise people wind up with these fuzzy targets, and it's like they're playing blind archery. And there's no point to playing blind archery. You're not going to hit the target. If you, if you don't know what you're aiming at, you're going to hit something else. Yeah. So... That said, if you want to look up the DSM-5 criteria for binge eating disorder, it has to do with the uh, frequency of eating past the point of discomfort, the frequency with which you hate yourself for doing that, the feelings of loathing and disgust, and a whole bunch of other things. And you could just Google DSM-5 binge eating if you really want to know that. But this is a, this is a methodology that works to help people restore their ability to eat within their own best judgment, to plan out what they want to do and do it, um, regardless of whether they're five pounds or 500 pounds overweight, regardless of whether they eat you know, 50 extra calories or 5,000 extra calories. Um, and I just think it's, uh, your, your pig wants to know as much as it can get away with. And I'm all for enjoying some of society's treats. Right? I'm not saying you should never have chocolate or never have ding-dongs or something like that, but, but I'd rather people did it in a very planned out way and, um, you know, and they, they knew where the edges were and they didn't feel out of control. Well, that's, that's the uh, question that popped up. Uh, very popular topics are things like, oh, I'm going to take a planned cheat meal or I'm going to take a week of a diet. The word, the phrase diet break is out there a lot right now. Like I'm doing a vacation and it's not going 
off the rails, but maybe their, their calories are more maintenance or, or whatever. It's a diet break and I'm adding more carbs in if I'm keto or something like that. Like, do you feel like that is okay as long as there are set rules and like a time frame around it? I find that two thirds of my clients can do that around most foods and substances. There are some clients and some substances, some clients, some substances for some people that they need to abstain from entirely. So for example, I don't eat chocolate at all anymore. The only having it on weekdays didn't really work. I had to evolve to not having okay. it at all. Yeah. But two thirds of the people that I work with, even if they were out of control before, when we very specifically talk about, you know, what would the parameters be if you were going to have chocolate, would you have it, you know, two ounces, three times a week, right? Two ounces of a dark chocolate three times a week, or you're going to have one dessert at a restaurant at the time of your choosing twice per calendar month. You define the parameters so that you don't have to use your willpower to make decisions at the moment of temptation, right? Yeah. The willpower is the magic word in my book, brother. Like that's something that when I find people really falling off the rails often, a lot of times they don't have a specific plan that they're accountable to. So they're they're constantly making those decisions like you just talked about. And that willpower muscle just gets fully depleted yep. and they've got yep. no defense system. That's exactly, that's, uh, you're a smart guy. Um, <laughs> no, it's exactly what happens. It's, it's um, the standard advice in our culture is to eat well 90% of the time and indulge yourself 10% of the time. But if you're going to, for example, avoid chocolate 90% of the time and eat it 10% of the time, how do you know when you're standing in front of that chocolate bar at Starbucks whether it's just a part of the 10% or the 90%, right? So every time you're in front of chocolate, you have another chocolate decision to make. If you want to have chocolate 10% of the time, tell yourself, I will only ever eat chocolate the last three days of the calendar month. That's 10% of the time, right? All your chocolate decisions are made all month long. Yeah, and, and so then you don't have to wear down your willpower to do it. So along those lines, I know people have this question. I know my audience, and so they like processes, they like filters. So if they want to figure out which bingeable foods are really in that danger zone that they need to maybe <laughs> never do again, like what are a few of the symptoms of like, okay, that's a never touch food for me? Um, okay, so first of all, I'd like to distinguish never touch foods from foods that you need to never touch for a while until you get back under control from them. Yeah, yeah. Because there are people that can be out of control of chocolate and then they'll do a 30-day experiment where they don't have it at all. And then after 30 days, they'll decide to have it once a week or something, and it goes fine. Okay. Um, the people who are out of control with chocolate decide to do it for 30 days, and then they try it again, and then they're even more out of control, and then we know that you, you're not going to do it, right? Yeah. Um, I find that people unconsciously know who they are with regards to that. Like, I can't tell, but they can. So I will have them imagine two different rules. Like, one rule might be... I will never eat chocolate again. Another rule could be, I will only ever eat chocolate on Saturdays and Sundays. And then I'll draw a line on a piece of paper and I'll project my life out a year under both scenarios. So let's say that my bullseye was, I will never eat chocolate again. What do I see when I look in the mirror in a year? Um, not only what do I weigh, but how much energy do I have? How obsessed with food am I? Um, what's the rest of my life like? Am I relating to my kids? Am I going walking and hiking? Am I you know, wearing the clothes that I want to wear? Am I doing well at work? Am I, have I stopped um, isolating myself? And this is not as relevant in the pandemic, but you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> but, but you know, like what, play out the whole future. What, what's the future going to be like? Then, okay, let's go to, I will only ever have chocolate on the weekends. What's life like in a year then? How is it different? Now, if there's no difference at all, the odds are that you unconsciously believe, like in your heart and your soul, that you can get away with moderating this. Okay. If there's a big difference or a big enough difference that you wouldn't want to live in the second scenario, then you probably need to let it go. Yeah, I think that, that's, how we, that's how we do it. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I love processes where we look into the future and just kind of mind map things out. And I find that just no matter what realizations we come to, just the process of doing that puts us at so much of an advantage over the traditional person like that we talked about that's just making decision after decision after it smacks them upside the head, like, oh, got to decide on this real quick. Uh, so I love techniques like that. 
Um, so let's, st- I know that you've got some amazing resources they've put together. I feel like we've piqued people's interest uh, with, with uh, what, you know, this topic of Ben Gening and, and your expertise. Uh, let's talk about your ebook a little bit, because I, I, I know, again, my audience loves taking action. We talk about our implementation alarms and setting those and all this stuff. So I love when people come to the show with great resources like you guys. So let's, let's discuss the, the ebook and the process behind it. Okay. Well, it's, it's actually a real book for which we have a Kindle Nook and PDF version. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we will give you the Kindle Nook and PDF version for free if you'd like it at neverbingeagain.com. Click on the big red button and sign up for the reader bonuses. We'll, we'll get that off to you. Um, so your question is, how did that develop or? Well, let's just talk about the, the, the a little bit behind the book and what people can, how people can take that and implement it and actually get some results. Yeah. So the book was originally a journal <clears throat> that I kept for eight years. Wow. And I was not going to publish it because I didn't, I was caught and caught up on my image as a sophisticated psychologist. And that's, that's all behind me now. <laughs> um, and I was, I was running a coach training organization. I was doing some other things. Um, but when I got divorced, I had to close everything down. And I was a minor partner in a publishing company. And they wanted to publish a book to prove that they knew what they were doing with marketing and attract better authors. So the CEO called me and said, hey, can you turn this thing into a book? And I said, all right, I can turn it into a book. And so I wrote the book and we published it in October of 2015. Um, he read it first and he called me back and he says, Glenn, donuts are pig slap. I don't eat donuts. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. <laughs> yes. And you're like, I've got them. Yeah, I got, and he, he's, he's since lost almost hundred pounds That's using awesome. that never begin with. And he's now the CEO of the company. Um, so we published it and, you know, we've both been in marketing for a lifetime. So we kind of knew what we were doing to get a little traction, but it, it took off on its own after that. It just, it just exploded. Um, and so now we have almost a million readers and we've got six other books and a coaching network. And it turns out to be, you know, we're, we're trying to help a million people a year stop overeating. Um, so that, that's what the book does. It, it was a journal of all the things the pig would say and how I disputed that logic. Like, like when it would say, um, oh, you know, you've failed so many times before you can't possibly mean that you're going to succeed this time. And I would say, well, look, if you're on a highway for a thousand miles and you don't take an exit, you can still take the next one. Or, you know, if my niece was learning how to walk, I didn't tell her, oh, you fell down so many times, you might as well just stay down. There are some things where the name of the game is staying in the game until you win the game and you keep failing until you don't fail anymore. Like, you know, fall down six times, get up seven, right? Is is that the proverb? Um, And so, you know, there were dozens of squeals like that that I struggled with over and over again. And I came up with the answers to them that made me feel a lot more confident and gave me control over the pig. And I turned that into a book. I, you know, I put some principled stuff. It's, it's not written like a scientific treatise. It's more of an allegory, um, like me me versus the pig. And it's written in very plain English, very pop psychology. Um, I write for psychology today also these days. Um, so I know how to write for the public is what, I, what I'm saying. Yeah. And um, yeah, so that, that's the book. And, you know, people can read it and get a sense of how the whole system works. And there's a part of the book that talks about how to create sets of rules for yourself after that first rule. Okay? Like, how do you progress and make that work? And um, there's also a workbook if you want it. So but neverbenchagain.com. It's free. I also recorded a bunch of free coaching sessions so people could hear. I know it's really weird. They must be thinking, what the hell, Adam? You have this Dr. Rod who's got a pig inside of him. What, what, <laughs> what's going on? What are you doing? This is really abstract and harsh. But it's actually a very compassionate system. And if you hear me actually coaching people, I, I take them from feeling hopeless and confused and powerless over food um, very despairing and depressed in the beginning to feeling hopeful and enthusiastic and um, powerful and confident in just one session. So I recorded a bunch of those sessions. Those are also free when you sign up. Um, we've got other resources. We've got forums and podcasts and things like that. So, uh, but it all starts at neverbingeagain.com when you click the big red button. Nice. And reclaiming control, that seems to be just the magic where people 
Uh, I've used the analogy of driving a car and your foot is all the way mashed down on the gas, but we don't have our hands on the, on the steering wheel. And we don't really feel like we can control that, where that's going. We're just, we just know we're going fast. And being able to reclaim, reclaim control, put our hands back on the steering wheel and navigate where we're trying to go. We may not get there perfectly, but like you said, uh, it's, it's about the attempt to go in the right direction and learning from when we get off course. And that's yeah. just, that's, that's the way I like my people to think. And you you got to remember that the pig is going to set the bar too high. It, it's going to give you, there's this old nursery rhyme that says when, when she was good, she was very, very good. But when she was bad, she was hard. And that's how the pig wants you to act. Like either be very, 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 very good or, or be horrid. But what if there was a middle ground? What if there's just a way to get started and take a breath and feel confident that you can maintain it and get this pig under control? And then you can make adjustments later. Yes. Yeah. I love it. I love it, Dr. Glenn. All right. Now, uh, I, we mentioned implementation earlier, and I'd love to make sure that our audience, uh, I'm sure they feel fully entertained, you know, uh, we, we have our gladiator moment. Are you not entertained? And uh, they are definitely entertained and inspired by what you've had to say. Let's say that somebody listening in is that typical person that we've kind of discussed of lost weight, gained it back, lost weight, gained it back, feeling out of control. If you could l- sit down across them, look them straight in the eye and just give them one action step to, that, that they could implement in the next 24 hours, what would that advice look like? It's kind of what I told you already, but I, I would first tell them that it's a lot less complicated than they think. There's a lot of misinformation out there. They're trying to live with the burden of all these other people's diets. And if they would just find one simple rule, one thing they'd be willing to do that would turn the ship around. Um, you know, maybe it doesn't restrict any food whatsoever. Maybe it's something like, uh, I always put my fork down between bites, right? Or I won't eat, I won't eat in front of a screen again. Maybe it's just something behavioral that, uh, you know, puts you in a different mindset and makes you a little more aware. Or maybe you always take a picture of your food before you eat it, right? That's awesome. Yeah. Like just a little awareness technique that, that moves the needle forward. Um, and, and remember that if, you are, if you're in a big ship and you're heading from New York to London and you want to turn it around, the decision comes first. And when the ship is turning from New York to London – it's still going to go towards London for a little while, right? But the decision has been made and you're starting to move in the other direction. And you have to be willing to go through that curve. You can't let the pig tell you, oh, look, you still weigh just a little bit more. You're not eating perfectly well yet. You got to be willing to go through that curve and give it a little time to, to make the turnaround and head back to, towards New York. And direction is much more important than speed. Yes. Much more important that you're you know, Socrates once told this guy who asked him how to get to Mount Olympus, he said, it's really simple. Just make sure every step you take is in the direction of Mount Olympus. So if every step you take is in the direction of New York, you're going to wind up in New York sooner or later. The direction is much more important than the speed. Beautiful yeah. analogy. Yeah. All right, Dr. Glenn, I uh, appreciate you so much. This has been, uh, as expected, just an amazing conversation. I know that my people have their earbuds on fire right now, and they are ready to take action and dig in. Uh, so thank you so much for the time that you've invested here with me in this conversation and in my community as well. Thanks, Adam. It was great. All right, everybody. You know what time it is. It's time to set your implementation alarm. What are you going to do in the next 24 hours to start you know, taking that step towards your own Mount Olympus and taking that right step every single day so that you can get out there and own it every meal, every workout, every day? I will see you on the next episode. Hey there, podcast fans. Thanks again for checking out this episode of the Million Pound Mission Podcast. I appreciate that so much. If you guys need a little extra help with your transformation journey, don't forget to head on over to millionpoundmission.com and sign up for my free mini course, The Seven Necessary Steps for Long-Term Weight Loss Success. This is like a checklist with videos showing you exactly how to make steady progress moving forward and never backslide again. Check it out at millionpoundmission.com.